You're listening to Book Insights, brought to you by Memoed, finding and simplifying the world's most powerful ideas to fit into your lifestyle. Each episode is a deep dive into a nonfiction bestseller that can change your life or make you think. In around 30 minutes, you'll learn all about a book that offers wisdom for your life, career, or business. So get ready to live and work smarter, better, and happier with Book Insights. Thomas J. Stanley and William Danko once put together an unusual focus group. It consisted only of millionaires. The participants weren't just millionaires, though. They were decamillionaires, people whose net worth exceeded $10 million. Stanley and Danko placed the decamillionaires in a room with a buffet of gourmet appetizers and fine wines so they would feel at home. Much to Stanley and Danko's surprise, the subjects barely touched the goodies. They nibbled on crackers. The only gourmets on the scene were among the non-millionaire research staff. In the 1970s, when Stanley and Danko began their research into the lives and habits of America's wealthy, they were surprised to find very little existing information. Their research and findings resulted in their best-selling book, The Millionaire Next Door, the Surprising Secrets of America's Wealthy. The authors were business academics who took an interest in the subject. Like most people, Stanley and Danko assumed that millionaires were ostentatious people with a taste for the finer things in life. Their initial research method, understandably, was to focus on people living in upscale neighborhoods. But their investigations brought two surprises. Firstly, many inhabitants of these ritzy suburbs were not, in fact, wealthy. Secondly, not even the genuinely wealthy were living in these areas. They were just as likely to be found in more modest neighborhoods. Stanley and Danko described the research effort behind their book as the most comprehensive ever conducted on who the wealthy are in America. Here is William Danko speaking with High Books. Well, it all started in the 1970s with the late Dr. Tom Stanley. He and I were conducting surveys through the U.S. Mail paper and pencil. And we had the respondents' zip codes, and we had indications of what their wealth was. And when we started examining the data, a couple of things popped out. There were some folks who lived in nice neighborhoods who were living paycheck to paycheck. They were on this economic treadmill, and as long as they kept running, they could sustain their lifestyle. But in contrast, in these so-called lesser neighborhoods, in fact, sometimes we describe them as industrial strength neighborhoods, where we get the tradespeople, the plumbers, the carpenters, those who own you know, heavy equipment companies. They could live modestly, but they had a substantial net worth, but it was a sustainable lifestyle. In this book, Insight, we'll highlight a few of the key findings from The Millionaire Next Door. In this part, we'll discuss the profile of a millionaire and what it means to live below your means. If typical millionaires aren't as glamorous as we might have supposed, what are they really like? Stanley and Danko paint a picture of a typical American male millionaire. Some characteristics that came up again and again. He's lived in the same town or city his whole life. He owns a small factory, a chain of stores, or a company providing a service. He got married once and remains married to that person. He lives in an area in which many people are not wealthy. He's a compulsive saver and investor. He's made his own money, inheriting nothing or little. They go further and boil this profile down to seven common denominators of the wealthy women and men. 1. They live well below their means. 2. They allocate their time, energy, and money efficiently, in ways conducive to building wealth. 3. They believe that financial independence is more important than displaying high social status. 4. Their parents did not provide money handouts. 5. Their adult children are economically self-sufficient. 6. They are proficient in targeting market opportunities. 7. They chose the right occupation. In summation, the three words that characterize the affluent best are frugal, frugal, frugal. Frugality is the basis of all wealth building and the main trait that distinguishes the prodigious accumulator of wealth, or PAW, from the 
under accumulator of wealth, or UAW. The average millionaire manages to invest a full 20% of their annual household income year after year. Non-millionaires spend everything or almost everything that comes in. Here is William Danko again, speaking with High Books. It's not about income. It's possible to have a modest income, as we show in The Millionaire Next Door, but if you're a prodigious saver and a prodigious investor, you can become very wealthy. On the other hand, there are some folks who make tremendous amounts of income. For example, I remember interviewing a physician who was making $300,000 a year, and that was a pretty good income, but his problem was he had a lifestyle that required about $350,000 a year. So this guy was on an economic treadmill, and one day he will have to retire. <laughs> but as long as he kept working, he could sustain this lifestyle, and the banks were glad to lend him money so that he could sustain his lifestyle. But that's not wealthy. <laughs> wealthy is somebody who can have financial freedom and do what they want to do when they want to do it, if they want to do it. In the physician's case, he has no choice but to continue working. And that's not fun. <laughs> Frugality also turns out to be a family trait. If your parents were financially prudent, you're likely to be the same. Spouses of most millionaires are often even more frugal than they are. Clearly, it's difficult to become wealthy if your spouse spends all your money. A bucket with a large hole in the bottom is difficult to fill. Some millionaires buy expensive suits, but they wait to buy them until they're on sale. They don't typically drive flashy imported cars, but more often are to be seen at the wheel of American-made ones that are several years old. Many millionaires even prefer shopping for bargain-used cars. The typical millionaire bought their house many years ago and lives in a modest, pleasant neighborhood. Remember, they are the millionaire next door, not in Beverly Hills or the Hamptons. In short, millionaires are in firm control of their finances. However much their wealth increases, they stick with their old habits of budgeting and planning. Think of the simple lifestyle of Warren Buffett, a multi-billionaire who exemplifies the mentality of the next-door millionaire. He's lived in the same house he bought decades ago, in a pleasant but not flashy part of Omaha, Nebraska. He grudgingly allowed his wife Susie to renovate their kitchen, only after calculating what he could have done with the money if it was compounded over time instead. Today, we discussed Thomas J. Stanley and William Danko's research into the American millionaire. We learned that most wealthy Americans live far below their means. They champion frugality more than frivolity. Next time, We'll conclude our discussion of The Millionaire Next Door, The Surprising Secrets of America's Wealthy. We'll go into the definition of wealth as well as the careers and upbringings of millionaires. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodeapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. Thomas J. Stanley and William Danko made a discovery. In their research of the wealthy, they found that most millionaires and decamillionaires don't live in gilded palaces. They don't drive Lamborghinis and freebase caviar. Most of them drive five-year-old Cadillacs. Most of them reluctantly renovate their kitchens. Most of them live right next door. Here is William Danko speaking with High Books. The lesson to all this, and especially from the financial services perspective, don't assume that all people who live in nice neighborhoods and drive light model cars can actually sustain their lifestyles. And essentially, for every wealthy person who can afford the luxuries of a nice neighborhood and a late model car, we have found repeatedly in our research that there are four or five other people who will try to emulate the same behavior. And why? Because they want to look wealthy. So, the question we have to ask is, do you want to be wealthy or do you want to look wealthy? These findings led Stanley and Danko to write their best-selling book, The Millionaire Next Door, 
The Surprising Secrets of America's Wealthy. Today we'll conclude this book insight with a discussion on a definition of wealth. We'll also discuss the careers and upbringings of millionaires. The majority of non-retired millionaires are business owners. In fact, business owners are four times more likely to be millionaires than employees. This may seem obvious. However, Stanley and Danko are quick to point out that the majority of business owners are not millionaires, and about 20% of millionaires are employees. Millionaires certainly earn more than non-millionaires, but the income levels are not out of reach of the average two-income household. Many millionaires have become rich by earning less than the average income. What they do with their money makes all the difference. The common thread among those who do succeed is tolerance for risk. This matters much more than picking the right type of business. Indeed, many millionaires own relatively low-profile businesses such as dry cleaners and parts supply companies. Not being burdened by pretense, millionaires are happy to capitalize an opportunity wherever they find it. Regardless of whether they're business owners or employees, the majority of millionaires greatly enjoy their work, typically putting in 45 to 55 hours per week. This recalls Marcia Sinitar's maxim, do what you love, the money will follow. By contrast, underaccumulators of wealth, or UAWs, will work to fund a habit of conspicuous consumption and luxury. In other words, they work to look wealthy, though they are not. Millionaires are frugal, but are they unrelenting misers? In fact, they do spend some money, but they generally do it wisely. Being savvy enough to have become wealthy, they naturally tend to spend their money in ways that maintain and increase their wealth. This includes carefully procuring professional services from expert investment advisors, accountants, tax specialists, and lawyers. They also recognize that good education is a solid investment. Many are willing to pay pricey private school tuitions for their children and grandchildren. Millionaires also recognize that financial security has little value without one's health. Your average millionaire will seek and pay for top quality medical and dental care. If you're fortunate enough to make a high income every year, does that make you wealthy? According to Stanley and Danko, definitely not. The proper measure of wealth is net worth. Most people have it all wrong about wealth in America, they say. Wealth is not the same thing as income. If you make a good income each year and spend it all, you are not getting wealthier. You are just living high. Wealth is what you accumulate, not what you spend. At the time the book was written in the mid-1990s, the surveyed millionaires had a medium net worth of $1.6 million and an average of $3.7 million. 6% had a net worth over $10 million. Clearly, these were not the super rich. They were the average people who had done well for themselves. It is Stanley and Danko's silver lining that this level of wealth is attainable for anyone starting from scratch. To gauge your progress on the road to wealth, Stanley and Danko suggest that your wealth is best judged by comparing your net worth with your income and age. They provide a useful rule of thumb. Your baseline net worth should at least equal your annual income times your age, all divided by 10. If you manage to accumulate at least twice this amount, you are a prodigious accumulator of wealth. This makes you a top 25% wealth accumulator. If you have less than half the baseline net worth, you are an under-accumulator of wealth, putting you in the bottom 25%. Finally, some lessons from the millionaires next door on how to raise children without spoiling them. Most millionaires did not attend private schools. Most received limited financial assistance as working adults even if their parents were affluent and most received little or no inheritance. Stanley and Danko offer sound advice based on their research into what has actually worked and not worked in terms of financially educating your children. Don't give monetary gifts to your adult children. This will make them financially dependent on you and will encourage them to be consumers. Instead, teach them your habits of frugality and discipline. 
Don't reveal your wealth to your children, at least not fully, until they are financially established adults. Otherwise, they may start spending more money than they should in anticipation of receiving a large inheritance, and discussions about inheritance can undermine family relationships. Don't brag about your success, or otherwise compete with your children. This will send confusing mixed messages and will harm your relationships with them. Teach your children that what matters is achievement, not material symbols of success. Money can be a measure of achievement, but it certainly isn't the only measure. The central message is that the best gift you can give your children is to help them develop character. To do that, they have to face the challenges of life, learn from experience, and thereby develop courage rather than being shielded by your wealth. The Millionaire Next Door, The Surprising Secrets of America's Wealthy, may look like a how-to-get-rich manual, but this is not what the book aims to do. Here is William Danko again, speaking with High Books. I'm convinced that these lessons are timeless. Although there are modern examples and trivial ways to update the uh, message in The Millionaire Next Door, I think everyone will benefit by rereading an essay from Benjamin Franklin titled The Way to Wealth. That was written in 1758, 260 years ago, but it's packed with knowledge. I mean, let me give you a quick summary here, if I could. Franklin says, if you want to be wealthy, you must be industrious and persevere. In fact, Franklin uses the phrase, there are no gains without pains. Simply put, stay the course, focus, don't give up, despite the hardships, that's how you press on. Franklin also advises us to be good stewards by overseeing our financial affairs with our own eyes. We've seen the frauds and the people getting defrauded in the financial service industry. You know, in The Millionaire Next Door, we devoted an entire chapter to frugality. Well, Franklin says the same thing. He says it's easier to suppress the first desire than to satisfy all that follow it. Coupling frugality and avoiding excessive debt provides a timeless lesson. Live below your means. <laughs> you know, that's timeless. Some additional advice from Franklin is not adequately covered in The Millionaire Next Door, but it really is in Richer Than a Millionaire. And two components especially, be humble and be charitable. Now, I'm uncomfortable about the notion of what it means to be a self-made millionaire. Franklin writes, and I agree, do not depend too much on your own industry and frugality and prudence, though excellent things, for they may all be blasted without the blessing of heaven, and therefore ask that blessing humbly. Finally, the concept of being charitable is central to true prosperity. We must all reflect on the question, what does it mean to be rich? The short answer, it takes more than money. Thomas J. Stanley and William Dango's true message is that consumption and opulence aren't important next to the peace that comes from doing fulfilling work. It's in the discipline of slowly building up a nest egg over time. It's also encouraging to hear that during the time of Benjamin Franklin, and even still today, great wealth was and is possible through saving, investing, and spending wisely. A huge thank you to Dr. Danko for joining us, and I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Book Insights. Thank you for listening to Book Insights. Check out the rest of our content at memodap.com. Please keep in mind that the information provided in or through our Book Insights episodes is for educational and informational purposes only. It's not intended to be a substitute for advice given by qualified professionals and should not be relied upon to disregard or delay seeking professional advice. Thank you.